I wonder how many of you still write letters today? You take pen and paper and you write a letter. How many of you still do that? Just raise your hand. Three people. Oh, four people. All right, four, five. Oh, you've never written me a letter, Mr. Leonard. Yes, I have. <laughs> Maybe you write a note. Maybe you send a card. I, I know some of you do because you give me notes. And sometimes I receive uh, letters slid underneath my door that are handwritten on paper. So I, I receive letters, but not as many as maybe I used to in the past. Letter writing is becoming more and more rare. First it was replaced with emails, then it was DMs, and now we just forward each other funny pictures and reels and memes. Personally, and I'll tell people this sometimes, I prefer text messages, and I rather commonly have good back and forth conversations in text message form. There's witnessing opportunities, theological questions and answers, discipleship, counseling, intercessory prayer via text message. Others of you might prefer telephone conversations. How about facts? Anybody still send facsimiles? Do we even know what that is anymore? It's a dinosaur technology. Faxes. Now the Apostle Paul, he wrote letters. True or false? Yes. Yeah, true and false. It appears that he dictated the letters and somebody else wrote them down. So I tricked you a little bit there. He, he probably dictated the letters. Others wrote them down. It may be because he had some kind of a vision problem or eye problem. He would sign the letters with his own hand. Galatians chapter 6, verse 11 tells us that he would use large letters, the distinguishing mark in all of his letters, so people knew it was his signature and not from somebody pretending to be the Apostle Paul. So imagine you're writing a long handwritten note to distant family members about whom you care very, very deeply about. You've communicated in your letter the gist of what you want to say, but now it's time to wrap things up. Now it's time to come to your conclusion. In Colossians, Paul has been writing to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ at Colossae. One unique thing about Paul and the church in Colossae is that he was never there. And I'll take that. Thank you. My hidden water has been found. Thank you. I appreciate Mark bringing me some water too. One neat thing about Paul and the church in Colossae is that he actually never visited Colossae. He was based in Ephesus for about three years. And while there, many people from the surrounding areas came to the great city of Ephesus. They came to know Jesus as their Savior through Paul's preaching and teaching. One of those guys, Epaphras, he brings the gospel with him. A hundred miles, he travels back towards the east, towards his hometown of Colossae, and there he teaches and preaches and starts the church. So Paul is writing to this church, which in one sense was founded by Paul, but really it was one of Paul's disciples, the disciple of Jesus, who was evangelized by Paul, who brought the gospel there. So Paul's writing this letter after many years and some pretty incredible circumstances. The Apostle Paul now finds himself in prison, in Rome, under house arrest. And what is he doing while he's in prison under house arrest? Nothing but complaining, right? No, 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 no. no. Okay, nothing but shooting the breeze with the guards who are guarding him. Hey, did you watch the latest football game? How about those races at Olympus? Can you believe who won? Oh, man, fastest man in the world. What about that marathon? 26.2 miles. Pretty incredible, right? No, Paul wasn't just shooting the breeze like we might do in that case. He wasn't complaining. He wasn't freaked out. What was he doing? He's writing letters to the churches. He's preaching the gospel to the prison guards. He's inspiring, encouraging, warning, exhorting, breathing, loving. And so Paul's Holy Spirit-inspired letter to the Colossians is an inspiring and soaring exaltation of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And now in chapter 4, he's coming to his conclusion. He's already theologically pointed to Christ as the center of everything. Jesus is exhaustively sufficient. He's exaltedly supreme overall. Practically speaking, if we trust in the fullness that is found only in Christ, when Christ is at the center, he will hold all things in our life together. 
That's the secret on our job to work heartily as for the Lord, to do all things with Christ upon the throne of our lives. There's neither Greek or Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, but Christ is all and in all, the scripture says. Whatever you do in word or deed, Colossians 3.17, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. In other words, if Jesus is at the center of your life, he will hold everything together. Not that it's going to go smoothly. Not that it's always going to be easy. Not that we're going to never have hardship, testing, or trial. Those things are promised to us as followers of Jesus. I mean, didn't Jesus say, count the cost before you become my follower? Didn't Jesus say, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me? So Jesus was pretty clear about the fact that temporarily being his follower might be difficult. But when he's in the center of our lives, everything holds together. So in short, Colossians reminds us of the sufficiency of Christ for successful Christian living. I'll say that again. This letter reminds us of the sufficiency of Christ for successful Christian living. As Paul comes to the conclusion of this letter, he's already laid out this argument, so now it's time to wrap things up. And today we'll see in chapter 4, verses 2 through 6, sort of like the in-conclusion part of a sermon. By the way, have you ever listened to a preacher who, now oh, maybe about 10 minutes to noon, says, in conclusion, and then 20 minutes later they're still concluding? Have you ever been a part of, not here at Montrose, though, okay? <laughs> All right, I usually say in conclusion when I can see people starting to get nervous going, on oh, the chicken's about to burn. Isn't it time for lunch? Sometimes it's hard for preachers to land the plane. So just to give you a little behind-the-scenes look at the, at the preaching test. But Paul here says basically, in conclusion, here's what I want you to remember in those verses that Sidney just read for us a few moments ago. We're continuing in Colossians, but we're beginning what... We're labeling a new series, and we'll call this Colossal Character. We're looking at the character studies of the people mentioned in Colossians chapter 4. We're going to meet some pretty interesting people there, like Tychicus. Say that name ten times fast. Uh, Onesimus, Aristarchus, and Mark, and Justice, and Epaphras, and Luke, and Demas, and Nympha, the church that meets in her house, and Archippus. We're going to get to meet some interesting characters, which I think will be an inspiring example for us as members of this local church and as members of the global body of Christ, the kingdom of God in the world today. But as we begin, the first character I want us to look at is the Apostle Paul himself. And the example that he sets for us in his concluding remarks in verses 2 through 6 of chapter 4. We'll call Paul the apostolic opportunist. Everybody say that with me. The apostolic opportunist. Apostolic means that he was a missionary, a church planter. He traveled around telling people the good news and starting churches in new places. He had the authority of Jesus himself as an apostle with a capital A. An opportunist means that Paul purposely made the most of every single opportunity that God gave to him. And we'll see that as we go through our text today. So first of all, in verses 2 through 4, we see that Paul makes the most of every opportunity to pray for others and request prayer for himself. He makes the most of every opportunity to pray for other people. And to request prayer for himself. And it will be interesting to see the kind of prayers that this man, unjustly arrested, sent to prison, the kind of prayers that he offers in that circumstance and that he desires in that circumstance. So, first of all, verse 2 says, Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. The first thing we see here about prayer, and the example that Paul the Apostle sets for us, is that we are to pray with steadfastness. Everybody say that word with me. Steadfastness. 
Pray with steadfastness. When I think of steadfastness, I think of uh, standing fast when an army is approaching, that overwhelming odds. I think of standing strong. I think of being unmovable. I think of being persistent. In particular, I think of the story that Jesus tells in Luke chapter 18 and verse 1. It's a comparison kind of story. One of those, if this is true in real life, how much more is this true about God? Jesus says in Luke 18, verse 1, a parable that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. Or I think the NIV says they ought always to pray and never give up. Never give up. And so he said in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. There was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. So the widow being somebody who in that social system of that day didn't have a lot of power. Her adversary had committed an injustice against her. She was crying out for justice. And the unjust judge for a while refused. But afterward, he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. Jesus makes the point Hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect to cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. The story isn't that God is an unjust judge and that we have to cajole him and twist his arm to get what we want. The story is, as affirmed by Jesus throughout the Gospels, that God is a loving father who cares deeply about his children, and he wants us to come to him in prayer. And if even an unjust judge will eventually do the right thing because of the persistence of the victim seeking justice, how much more will God respond in his good, pleasing, and perfect will to our prayers? So pray with steadfastness. We might think of a, a parent praying for a wayward child. And... Boy, sometimes we can get uh, anxious, we can get troubled, we can try to control the situation, and then later on we go, maybe I should try a prayer. Maybe that would help. At Montrose, we like to say, what is it that we say, Rick? Prayer is a first, our first response, response and, not the last resort. and not our last resort. Prayer should be our first response and not our last resort. So when we're praying for a family member, praying for a situation in our life, maybe a health concern, praying for a, a lost loved one that we want to come to Jesus, we want to be steadfast in our prayers. I've told you the story before of my childhood friend, Amy. I knew her from really a very early age and grew up with her in early elementary school and she was in our youth group at church. She, I remember, every time we were together, we prayed for her grandpa. Every time we had prayer requests, please pray for my grandpa and his salvation. Pray that he would humble himself, that he would confess his sin to God, and that he would place his faith in Jesus Christ. Every single time that we were together, and sometimes the boys in the youth group would kind of go, oh, here we go again, praying for grandpa. But what a beautiful answer to prayer when by her senior year in high school, Grandpa prayed to receive Jesus as his Savior. God answered those prayers after a, a whole childhood of praying. And I always think about that and I say, am I that steadfast in prayer? I tend to be an active person. I like to do things and try to work things out. But do I have the faith to get on my knees and pray first. Steadfastness. How else should we pray? Pray with watchfulness. Pray with watchfulness. It says there uh, in Colossians chapter 2, as he's encouraging uh, the people in Colossae, uh, setting them a good example and calling them not only to pray with steadfastness, but being watchful in it. Of course, we're reminded of Jesus and the disciples in the garden, aren't we? He told them to keep watch and pray. 
Spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Keep watch and pray, lest you fall into temptation. And what did they do when Jesus came back those three times? He found them saw logs. They were sleeping. We've got to pray with watchfulness. Keep watch, Jesus says in Matthew 25, 13. You know neither the day nor the hour. So what does it mean to pray with watchfulness? Well, I think it means to stay awake. To stay awake. Don't, don't be distracted. Maybe get yourself a cup of coffee. Or maybe you're one of those active people. In today's day and age, there's so many distractions. It's hard for us sometimes just to sit and be quiet and pray. So maybe you got to leave the house and go for a walk. I, I heard a preacher say the other day the secret to his prayer life what was two things. The first one was his dog, and the second one was their church's prayer list. And he said it's because of the dog needing to go for walks that his prayer life was greatly benefited because he would take his dog for a walk and pray the entire time based on the church's prayer list and concerns that have been shared with people. So stay away. Think about how you can eliminate distractions. One thing that I've done and that I do is to use a prayer journal and to write out my prayers. I find that it helps me to focus my mind in a way I have a hard time doing when I'm just kind of sitting there with my eyes closed. Because when you sit in this modern, busy society, when you sit for a moment and close your eyes, your mind just goes crazy. And so sometimes it's important to write out your prayers. Or even Martin Luther himself, we think of him as some kind of spiritual giant, not a perfect man by any means, but Martin Luther said that... <laughs> Praying silently was too difficult for him, so he had to pray out loud. Sometimes he shouted when he prayed. Sometimes he put, one time he threw uh, a jar of ink at the devil when he was praying uh, and, and seeking to do the Lord's work. So stay awake. Also stay alert. Stay alert, as Jesus says. Keep watch lest you fall into temptation. So be alert that the evil one's going to try to distract you. Somebody said, if you don't get many phone calls, the one guarantee to get a phone call is start praying. Because as soon as you start spending some focused time with the Lord, you're going to get 10 phone calls all of a sudden. Why? Well, it's not that those people are evil. It's that the devil doesn't want you to be focused and to pray. Because the powers of darkness know the power of prayer. If only the church knew the true power of prayer. And then stay aware when you pray. Stay aware when you pray. Be aware of the Spirit's leading in your life. Pause when you pray. Say something like, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, tell me right now what I need to know. And then be quiet and wait for him to speak. Wait for him to lead. Now, I'm not saying you're going to hear some audible voice. But I think as Christians, we have impressions on our hearts. And maybe God says, I already spoke. Pick up the word and read it. And God gives us the exact word that we need to hear. Maybe maybe God speaks to our hearts. And maybe we say, I don't even know what to pray for or who to pray for. Just say, God, give me one name. I guarantee you, as a follower of Jesus and loved by the Holy Spirit, if you pray to God and say, Lord, give me one name to pray for, a name will immediately appear in your mind. And some of you, if you're a doubter, you say, well, that's just what you ate last night for dinner, bringing that to mind. No, I believe it's the Holy Spirit bringing that to mind. So pray with watchfulness, stay awake, alert, aware. What's the third way we are to pray? Can you guess from the text in Colossians chapter 2? With what? Thanksgiving. Thankfulness, yes. Pray with thankfulness. I like alliteration, so they all got to end in the same way. Steadfastness, watchfulness, thanksgiving, or thankfulness. We want to give thanks when we pray. If you do a word study on the word give thanks or thanksgiving, Paul was always offering to God thanksgiving, always offering to uh, the Lord uh, a spirit of thankfulness. One verse that comes to mind is from the next book in the Bible, back from Colossians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. He says, give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. 
Some people will say, especially younger people, are kind of starting out their lives, what, what's God's will for me? What does God really want for me? Well, I'll tell you one thing the Bible is very clear about. God's will for you in Christ Jesus is to give thanks in all circumstances. Now, I don't believe it means for all circumstances. There are some things that we pray against. There are some circumstances that we never want to go through or never want to repeat or that we never want to see anybody go through. But in those circumstances, we can give thanks. And Paul is living proof of that. Because where is Paul writing Colossians from? Prison. From prison. House arrest in Rome, most likely, is his current situation. So he's not yet in that deep, dark, damp prison of 2 Timothy, waiting for the axe to fall in his execution. But still, for a guy who's a world traveler, who's always visiting the churches, imagine how hard it was to be literally in chains to a Roman guard. Very difficult situation that he finds himself in. Yet he's thankful. Pray with thanksgiving. Another verse that comes to mind is Luke 17 and verse 17. Luke 17, verse 17. You might remember the story of ten men who were healed of what skin disease? We don't know the exact disease, but the Bible labels it as a broad term, leprosy. Ten men are healed. One of them, who is not Jewish, he is a Samaritan. Which one returns after he is healed to give Jesus thanks? The Samaritan. Only one out of ten return to give God thanks. I wonder... In our current situation as Christians, what percentage of people right here in this church give God thanks on a regular basis? What percentage of people here in this church give God thanks on a regular basis? I hope it's more than 10%. I truly hope it's more than 10%. But I know in my life, how many times do good things come and go and I simply fail to give thanks? So we want to pray with thanksgiving. And verses 3 and 4 then, I think, is also very instructive to us because we want to pray with specificness. Now, I looked that up, and that is a word, specificness, or specificity. We want to pray with specificness. I believe that specific prayers lead to specific thanks. And one of the reasons why Paul sets us an example of why Jesus wants us to pray specifically is so that we will know when those prayers are answered. If you just kind of say, Lord, I pray for church this morning, how are you going to know if that prayer is answered? But what if you say, Lord, I pray that so-and-so will come to church today. Or I pray that somebody who hasn't been in church for a while will be led by the Lord to come to church today. Well, that's still a kind of general prayer. But let's say that so-and-so comes to church today. What are you going to do? Oh, my goodness, Lord. Thank you. Yeah. What are you going to do if somebody who hasn't been here for a while comes to church? You're going to go, thank you, Lord. Wow, that's awesome. See the difference? And so it's important to say, Lord, pray for church today. I'm not saying don't, don't pray that. What I'm saying is be a little more specific in your prayer so that you can give God specific praise when your specific prayers are answered. So let's take a look at how Paul uh, specifically wants us to pray. He says, at the same time, pray for us also. Okay, here we go. Paul's going to be like, get me out of this jail. It's unjust, it's horrible, I hate it, it's the worst. I've got raw chain marks on my ankles. The Roman soldiers are smelling, they don't shower before they come for their four hours of duty. This is the worst. Stuck here with, I want to be traveling, I want to see the churches, I want to do my job as an apostle. At the same time, pray for us also. What does he say specifically? That God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison. That I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. Now, open a door could be a reference to open the prison door so that I can leave and continue my work as an apostle. 
But it's interesting that Paul is continuing the gospel ministry and his work as an apostle, even in the closed doors of his house arrest, even in chain to a Roman soldier. And so I think the idea of open to us a door for the word doesn't have so much to do with get me out of jail, but give me opportunities to preach and proclaim Jesus to others. So pray with specificness. Paul here says, pray that God will give me an open door to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in chains. And we'll talk more about that open door in just a moment when we get to verse number five. But I want to share with you my experience recently in New York City. Some of you know that I was blessed to go with Word of Life to New York City, and we hit the streets in all five, is it five boroughs of New York City? I think so, right? We hit the streets proclaiming Jesus. We were in Manhattan, my team. I think there was like 25 teams of around 10 students each that went out. We were in Manhattan, Times Square Theater District, the Lower East Side, Thompson Square Park, and a couple of other places. Uh, just praying with people, sharing Christ. And I was nervous about the trip. i got to tell you, because I'm not familiar with New York City. I got uh, 17, 18, 19-year-old kids that are with me, and I'm hoping to have a really experienced guy who's going to help us on the subway system, that I kind of get there and find out I'm that guy. <laughs> and it's not too difficult. It's not too hard. It's actually a pretty good subway system. But then one day as I'm leaving the hotel, the, um, the, the guy who kind of helps out with the elevators, I asked him which which uh, way I should go to get on a certain uh, eastbound train. And he said, oh, go to this place and make sure you go down these steps. And then he said, oh, by the way, don't stand too close to the tracks. I was like, well, why not? He says, because people like to push you off. I thought, what? <laughs> Apparently that's a thing in New York City. So anyway, it probably has only happened like twice, but uh, and it's kind of scary, right? So. Yeah. So I was praying about that. Um, I don't want to put you on the spot, but was anybody here praying for me while I was in New York City? I, uh, that's the one thing I really asked was for prayer. He said, thank you very much. And you were probably praying for my safety. I, I talked to a few yes. people who said, pray for Pastor Jason and for his safety and for the safety of the kids that are with him. Yeah. But even more important than safety, I hope you were also praying for open doors for the gospel of Jesus Christ and open up hearts to receive the good seed of God's word. And so, as you see in the bulletin, it's really small print, but the Word of Life New York City Open Air Evangelism trip, there were 19,152 gospel contacts. That's almost 20,000 people. Now, that might be they received a tract or they talked to somebody, somebody prayed with them, whatever that might be, a big, wide range of things. 19,152 open doors for the gospel. 2,874 gospel conversations. And what that means is that somebody talked to a lost person who didn't know Jesus and presented the entire gospel from there's a holy God who created you and loves you to there is sin in your life that separates you from holy God to God love you so much he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for your sins in your place on your behalf, to you must turn from your sins and trust in Jesus as your Savior. For if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Amen? Amen. 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 So that's a lot of conversations that college kids are having. All you saw on the news was the people at NYU and Columbia getting a little crazy, and that was just a small number of them plus some outside agitators, right? That's all you saw on the news. The devil didn't want you to know about 300 college kids going all around New York City not protesting but proclaiming Jesus. That's what was really going on. And 126 people prayed to receive Jesus as their Savior for the very first time. Can we just give God a round of applause for that? So, 
If you were praying for open doors for the gospel, if you were praying for Pastor Jason to be safe, to have wisdom, we didn't lose anybody from our team. And if you were praying for boldness, God did that exact thing. I want to tell you a few stories, okay? Uh, here's a funny one. Uh, one of the young men in the trip, 18-year-old college kid, as you would be, as I would be, nervous. Yeah. On the streets, getting a little discouraged, saw some of his bolder friends talking to people about Jesus. And he goes, Lord, just give me one person to talk to. And he's just kind of getting dejected. And, you know, and he's kind of like, I gotta go to the bathroom. So it's hard to find the bathroom, right? When you're in downtown areas. So he goes to the bathroom, he does his thing, and he realizes there's a guy that's fell next to him. And the Holy Spirit goes, Hey, buddy, this is your chance, captive audience. And so he says, Hey, man. Um, the guy goes, Hello. And he says, uh, we're in New York City telling people about Jesus. And he gives to him the whole gospel presentation. And at the end of it, he says, would you like to pray to receive Jesus? And the guy in the stall next to him says, yes, I would. And he led him to Jesus. Wow. And as the young man tells the story, he says, so I, I finished my thing and prayed with him and uh, washed my hands and left. Never saw his face. <laughs> Never got to meet him. But man, the guy just all next to him, ready to receive Jesus. What a cool story. Uh, when we got to our particular place that we were assigned, we did a, a prayer walk, walking up and down uh, the block, praying for God to open our eyes to opportunities and people to talk to. And two young ladies that were on my team were both super nervous to share their faith. And uh, somehow they started talking to a couple of guys who were slightly high. So I went and kept an eye close eye on them. But they were able to share the gospel with these guys, and one of them, I believe his name was Kyle, prayed with them to receive Jesus as his Savior. And that was such a cool, cool opportunity. Another guy in my group named Peter, uh, he saw two people playing dice and uh, learned the new dice game. By the way, I joined them at the end. I'm the unluckiest dice person ever. <laughs> Peter announced that to everybody at the last night that we were in New York City, don't ever play dice with Pastor Jason because you can't play dice. So, but he just sat down and started playing dice with them. And before you knew it, they were having a gospel conversation. They didn't pray to receive Jesus before they left, but they left with the knowledge of salvation. Uh, another guy in our group named Micah, uh, he was walking through the park. He saw a guy playing a guitar. Micah likes guitar. So he struck up a conversation with him. Opportunity to share about Jesus. Paul was praying for open doors and opportunities. This is what we saw all over in New York City. Uh, one thing that was hard was not speaking people's language. So I noticed that one of the parks that we were at, there were some people serving food. And so I went and talked to them, thanked them for being out there. They were part of the Good Neighbor Association. And there was a long line of men, all men, they were recently arrived immigrants, not from the southern border, but from Guinea in West Africa. Uh, all of them spoke French. I don't speak French. But I did have my cell phone with me. And so via Google Translate, I was able to pray with the entire line of Muslim men from Guinea in my prayer through Google Translate to share the gospel of Jesus and pray for them, blessing in Jesus' name. So God gives those open doors and opportunities. And one more, some of you heard this last Sunday night. One young man shared that he was having a hard time getting up his courage to go share Christ with strangers, so he found a security guard and said, there's a safe guy to tell about Jesus. So he goes up to the security guard. All he can muster up the courage to do is give him a tract. And so he gives the security guard a gospel tract, and then he goes about his way. A couple hours later, this young man has to go to the bathroom. I don't know, God can use having to go to the bathroom as a gospel opportunity. And somebody says, oh, go down to Macy's. You want to go up to the fourth floor. There's a bathroom there that you can use. So the young man goes all the way up, three sets of escalators to the fourth floor, looks everywhere, cannot find the bathroom. But you know what he found? He found that security guard standing there with a gospel track in his hand on his break. And the guy said, hey, it's you. I just read this gospel tract. Can you help me understand what it means? Is that not a miracle? Yes. Is that not incredible? 
that God can do that. So pray with specificity. Pray for God to open doors, and, and when God does, we can give Him thanks, and we can. Wouldn't it be great if every Sunday we came together and sat around telling these kinds of stories? You know, like those war stories, like, yeah, this is what happened to me this week, and you want to believe what God did, and, oh, pray for this person. You know, it's great that we pray about our health concerns, and it's great that we pray about some tough circumstances in our life, but let's really show what we prioritize and pray for the lost and pray for open doors that we may speak clearly the mysteries of Jesus. Pray for our missionaries. We support five missionaries as a church. And I would encourage you, maybe you know, one for each weekday, one for each finger on your hand, to pray for our missionaries. You know, you can make the thumb, uh, Pastor Tyler and Amy in South Dakota. Thumb's very useful. Tyler was a huge part of our church in the past when he was an associate yes. pastor here. So pray for Tyler and Amy Greyhouse and their ministry in, in South Dakota. And you can pray for the Chosnies and their ministry in Croatia. You can pray for the Sawyers and their ministry in um, Kenya. And get more specific than even just their names. The, the Chosnies are in media ministry. And they translate episodes of Charles Stanley into Croatian to be broadcast on local TV. Isn't that cool? Yeah. So people can watch, uh, what is it called? Uh, what's this <coughs> program called? In Touch Ministries. Uh, with Charles Stanley. Uh, pray for Tyler and Amy Greathouse as they seek to reach out to the, the cattle ranchers in their community, but also to the Lakota Sioux tribe uh, that lives right there in the midst of them as well. They have VBS outreach coming up this summer, so pray for that. Pray for the Sawyers in Kenya as they have, a, I believe it's a girls, a school there, and uh, a special home for exploited girls. Pray for the Sawyers and what they're doing in Kenya, and pray for the Krauss family. They just arrived back from uh, a year and a half in Ecuador uh, where they were learning Spanish, and now they're back in America, hitting the major cities of America and bringing the good news of Jesus. Aaron was one of the main leaders of the big Word of Life outreach in New York City, and that was my connection uh, that offered me the opportunity uh, to go there and be a part of that. And then pray for what God is doing in the Philippines through Pastor Joel Guanzone and uh, Faithway Bible Baptist Church. Is that right? Faithway. So pray for Pastor Joel and what he is doing there. So be specific in your prayers for our missionaries and those that are spreading the good news of Jesus. All right, as we come to uh, the conclusion, not in conclusion, but to the conclusion of our text, Paul... Not this Paul, by the way. We're talking about the Apostle Paul. So, can we, can we make that clear? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Paul makes the most of every opportunity to share the good news of Jesus Christ with those who are lost. That's not surprising, is it? No. I think we guess that's the case. And that's what Paul tells us to do in Colossians chapter 4 and verse 5. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time, redeeming the time, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer each person. So what does it mean to make the most of every opportunity to share Christ with the lost? When he's talking about outsiders, he's talking about the lost, those who are outside the protective community of Christ. First of all, how do we do it? We should share with wisdom. Share with wisdom with wisdom. Uh, read the gospel. See how Jesus dealt with people. When people ask Jesus a question, did he always just give them an immediate answer? No. What did he most often do? You ask Jesus a question, he asks you a question. Why? He wants to keep the conversation going. He wants to lead people uh, to truly think about what he's saying. So often as Christians, somebody asks us a question, I do the same thing, I immediately get defensive. Or I feel like I have to have the exact correct theological answer, or I, I back up the dump truck, beep, 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 and they're like, no, here it comes, and dump the gospel on them and more theology than they could ever possibly handle. But sometimes we got to realize that 
our role may simply be to chip away at some of the scales of unbelief in their life. It may be somebody else's role uh, to lead them across the finish line of faith, but, but we need wisdom, and that was what drew me earlier to the passage in Isaiah 33, uh, uh, verse 6, where it says, Of the Lord in Zion, he will be the stability of your times, abundance of salvation, wisdom, and knowledge. The fear of the Lord is Zion's treasure. So ask the Lord for wisdom. And, and say to him, Lord, tell me what I need to know. And then show me what I ought to do based on that knowledge. And I believe that God will, will give us that wisdom as we, uh, as we share with outsiders. We're to share with timeliness. Share with a sense of timeliness, a, a sense of, of, of urgency. Ephesians 5 and verse 16. Ephesians 5 verse 16 says... Verse 15, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Knowing that the days are evil, don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Don't be caught up in civilian affairs. Rather, devote yourself to that which is eternal and have a sense of urgency, timeliness, Share with gracefulness. Gracefulness. It says in Colossians 4 and verse 6, Let your speech always be gracious. Gracious speech. You see, the same mouth that shares the good news of Jesus Christ should not also be sharing crude jokes. The same mouth that speaks the blessings of the gospel should not also bear the cursing of profanity. You don't want to have a fresh water and salt water flowing out of the same spring because the salt water will always contaminate the fresh water. And so blessing and cursing, James tells us, ought not to proceed from the same lips. So share with gracefulness. When we're thinking about the lost, I might extend this further to say, there but by the grace of God go I. Yeah. Rather than, than sitting in judgment over that person and going, I can't believe where they come to in their life, ought we not to say, man, Lord, I, I'm so thankful that I had pretty decent parents who introduced me to Jesus. This is me talking, of course, not your story. They introduced me to Jesus, and, and I can say, it's, maybe my life is pretty well ordered, and things are going along pretty well. That has nothing to do with, with me and my choices and my goodness. That's all God's grace. And then somebody else says, well, my life wasn't like that at all. You should have seen my childhood. But God's brought you here now, not because of something special that you did, but because of how special Jesus is and what he did and God's grace to you. So we can speak with gracefulness to people because we know that there but by the grace of God go we. Even with those who are doubters, even with those who say rude things about Christ, we can be gracious. We should also share with saltiness. Saltiness. Now, we shouldn't be salty. People used to... Uh, Say, uh, and there's nothing against those in the naval community, but swear like a sailor or salty or something like that, and that would mean profanity. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking saltiness in terms of what Jesus says you are the salt of the earth, and we don't want the salt to lose its saltiness, or else we're good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled by men. So, saltiness, and what does it mean? Uh, to be salty, well, first of all, it means to get out of the salt shaker and into the world. We've got some salt sitting in our cupboard, the salt shaker. I think it's the same salt shaker that we got for our wedding. And it sat in there so long that it won't even shake out anymore. And I don't know if you're a fan of Taylor Swift or not, but maybe we just need to kind of shake it out a little bit. That's not quite the song, but you can. <laughs> but some of us have been in the salt shaker so long, God turns us upside down and shakes us, and we don't even, don't even come out with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we've got to get out of the salt shaker and into the world. 
And what does salt do? Salt seasons. That's the main idea here in Colossians 4 and verse 6. Seasoned with salt. I like what the ESV study Bible says. It says this statement echoes the teaching of Jesus to his disciples. When applied to conversation, the metaphor suggests speaking in an interesting, stimulating, and wise way. <clears throat> interesting, stimulating, and wise way. Way. Paul's comments assume the Colossian believers are vitally involved in the local surrounding community and have ample opportunities to interact with outsiders. That means that if you're so involved here at church that you have no time for your neighbors, no time for outside activities, no time to be involved volunteering outside of this church, then, then maybe you might need to step back from something at church so that you can be a little more out of the salt shaker and a little more in the world. One cool thing about our ministry in the city is that the world comes to us. So we have things like our Golden Diners program. We have other activities where uh, the community comes here for refuge or uh, for help. Some of us are involved in our local food pantry. We meet a lot of people there uh, at the local food pantries. And not only can we give out food, but we can share the love of Jesus. And that's a beautiful thing. So salt seasons. Uh, second of all, salt preserves, doesn't it? Not the primary idea here, but part of being salty is being a preserving influence in society. And one other thing about salt is that salt is sometimes used as a healing agent. So salt stings when it heals. If you're filling in the blanks, it would be two things. Salt stings and salt heals. Sometimes salt stings. A little bit when it heals. So Jesus, when he's speaking to the woman who's caught in adultery, first of all, he rebukes all those throwing that want to throw stones at her, let him who is without sin pass his first stone. But then he says to her, Now you go and sin no more. So sometimes being salt that heals means that our words are going to initially sting. Just like a surgeon who heals must cut and cause some pain. For betterment in the end. So sometimes when we speak the truth in love, the truth hurts. But when we speak it in love, the truth can heal. So that's what our goal is, to speak the truth in love. Sometimes it stings, but it stings when it heals. I uh, remember as a kid getting stung by a bee. And the uh, down-home Southwest Michigan cure for a bee sting was to take some seasoned salt, mix it in a little bit of water, stir it all together, and apply that to the bee sting. And guess what? A real quick sting, but then the pain goes away. Oh, so they can so yeah. Try that too. Yeah. But salt is our illustration. So <laughs> it doesn't say, uh, you know, What's you are the baking soda of the earth. So let's, let's stick with salt for now. Uh, so share with salt in this. Has anybody never been stung by a bee? I'm always amazed by the fact that some people have never. Uh, guess, guess who's most afraid of being stung by a bee? Those who have never been stung by a bee. It's not that bad, folks. So if it happens to you, never been stung by a bee. Oh, you have. Okay. Okay. I have, and I'm still scared. <laughs> yeah, I do. They do. They do. Yes, they do. One more thing about how we ought to share. Share with a ready defense, so that you may know how to answer each. Person share with a ready defense. And if you're familiar with First Peter, you probably know I'm thinking of First Peter 3 and verse 15 it says, In your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense, an apologia, to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do so with gentleness and respect. Always be ready to share the reason. For the hope that you have. Always point to Jesus as the reason for the hope that you have in him. And so Paul was an opportunist. And by that we mean the most positive way possible. He always made the most of every opportunity to pray and to request others to pray. He said, always, when I remember you, on every occasion I give thanks for you as I pray for you. 
Always he was in prayer for the people of the churches. Of the Colossians, he said, when we pray for you, always giving thanks and always being willing to request prayer. <clears throat> One more story about New York City. It's hard to ask for prayer. Why? Because of pride. If you're not asking for prayer from people, it could be because pride has taken a root in your life. We had a big sign that the kids made that we were carrying around. It said, need prayer? Question mark. One guy saw our sign, literally with spit flying out of his mouth, said, I don't need prayer, you do. And we were like, well, yeah, we do, thanks. <laughs> Appreciate that. And then the kids were crestfallen and discouraged, but not 10 seconds later, another guy said, hey, are you guys praying for people? Because I could use some prayer. Wow. So we, pride can keep us from asking for prayer. Paul prayed for others, and he asked for prayer for himself. And he made the most of every opportunity to share the good news of Jesus with the lost. You know, some of us are not living on point like Paul did because we don't get the point. And the word of Jesus to us today as we prepare to take communion together isn't that we need to share our faith with the lost, it's that we are lost and we need faith. And God's Holy Spirit may be working on your heart saying, I created you, I love you, but there's sin that separates you from me. And no matter how hard you try, no matter how much you go to church, you're never going to be over, able to overcome the weight of your sin. So turn from your sins and trust in me, Jesus is saying, that you might be forgiven and free, that you might be saved for everyone who confesses with their mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believes in their heart that God raised him from the dead will be saved. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So maybe if you're not getting the point of today's message, it's simply because you haven't gotten the point of the gospel. Others of us, we get the point, we're saved, but we lost track of our priorities. So I would urge you to remember to keep the main thing, the main thing. Share the good news of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. Leave the results totally up to God. And when you win somebody to Christ, don't just leave them there at the start line. Walk beside them throughout the journey, discipling them closer to Jesus. I pray Paul's example encourages us to get back on track as a church, back on track as individuals, and to get to the point. Gracious Father in heaven, thank you so much for the example of the Apostle Paul. God, I don't have his giftings and his particular abilities or talents, and I dare say nobody in this room today emulates that in the exact same way, but we can, we can build our lives as Christians after a positive pattern like the one that he sets for us. Even more so, we look past Paul and his imperfections to Jesus, who is the one that we pattern our lives after. And God, I pray for anyone here today who may be in the category of someone who is lost. Searching for truth has brought them to this place. I ask God that in this special moment, your spirit drawing them to Jesus, that they, in their own words, might confess their sins to you and just say, Lord, thank you for loving me and creating me, but I know I am a sinner, and you are holy, holy, holy. So, Lord, I confess my sin. And I give you thanks. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sin. I know that he rose in the grave on the third day. And so I ask you, Jesus, to save me from my sins. I ask you, Jesus, to come into my life. Be my Savior. Be my Lord. I pray this as sincerely as I know how, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.
Praise the Lord. I want to ask our deacons uh, and others who may be helping.